I'm Dirk Larson, and I'm a biostatistician at Mayo Clinic. I will describe some basic concepts related to competing risks in orthopedic studies. Survival analysis, which is also referred to as time to event analysis, is a widely used statistical methodology in orthopedic research. In survival analysis, we model and analyze time to event data. Time to event data refers to data that involves an event, and the outcome of interest is the time until the event occurs. Survival analysis estimates the survival function, which is the probability that a patient does not experience the event of interest at a given time. In a typical follow-up study, only a small subset of patients will experience the outcome of interest. For the remaining individuals, the time to event will be unknown. This condition is called censoring. Patients are censored when one of three things occurs. They do not experience the outcome by the end of the study, they are lost to follow-up or withdrawn from the study before it ends, or they die during follow-up. If patients who are censored are as likely to have a later event as patients who remain under observation, then censoring is said to be non-informative. Censoring should not occur due to reasons related to the event. If there is a reason why patients do not return for follow-up, the censoring becomes informative. A competing risk is any event that prevents the event of interest from occurring. Competing risks violate the non-informative censoring assumption because they modify the chance that the study outcome occurs. The most obvious competing risk is death. When patients die before experiencing the outcome of interest, their chance of experiencing the study outcome is zero. Here are some examples of competing risks in orthopedics. The competing risk is not always mortality. Suppose hospital-acquired infection is the event of interest. Discharge from hospital without infection is a competing event since it generally precludes the observation of infections that might later occur. Censoring of patients who experience competing events creates two problems. First, they are censored in an informative way. Second, the probability of experiencing the outcome of interest is estimated in an unrealistic setting in which the competing events cannot occur. The competing risk equivalent of the Kaplan-Meier method is the Allen johansson cumulative incidence method. The most common analysis adjusting for competing risks uses the cumulative incidence function, which estimates the probability of experiencing the event of interest before the occurrence of a competing event. When there are no competing risks, the cumulative incidence function can be correctly estimated as 1 minus the Kaplan-Meier estimate of the survival function. Under the Allen johansson method, patients who experience competing events are considered no longer to be at risk of developing the event of interest. As a result, the cumulative incidence function is lowered by the occurrence of competing events. In other words, the Allen johansson method estimates a smaller cumulative incidence of the event than the Kaplan-Meier method. However, the extent of this difference depends on the proportion of patients experiencing the event of interest and the type of competing event. Here's an example of a study examining risk of revision in knee arthroplasty patients. In patients aged 65 to 74 years, the incidence of mortality, the green line, is higher than the incidence of revision. The Kaplan-Meier method overestimates the risk of revision by 11% at 10 years and by 45% at 20 years. In contrast, in younger patients aged 45 to 54 years, the incidence of mortality is lower than the incidence of revision throughout follow-up. In this case, the Kaplan-Meier and cumulative incidence estimates, accounting for competing risk of death, do not differ as much, at least with the shorter follow-up. If you're wondering how to assess competing risk in your study, let me tell you a few practical tips. When dealing with survival analysis and competing risk, it is important to correctly identify the study population and the patients who experience the outcome of interest during follow-up. If your goal is to compare two or more groups, examine completeness and differences in the percentage of patients who are lost to follow-up across groups. In the presence of multicenter data, consistency in treatments, follow-up intervals, and mechanisms across centers need to be examined as well. Review the last follow-up dates and censoring times for the remaining patients in the data set. 
The censoring date for patients who did not yet experience the outcome is their last in-clinic or other follow-up date. The censoring date for patients who are deceased without experiencing the outcome is their death date. Assess the possibility of informative censoring. This requires a careful review of the data collection procedures to make sure data were collected uniformly on those with and without events. Graphical comparison of the event times and the censoring times could be used to observe differences in the distribution. If the follow-up is good, the event times may be shorter than the censoring times. However, if the censoring times are shorter than the event times, it may be an indication of informative censoring. Evaluate the presence of competing risks. As a rule of thumb, competing risk analysis should be considered when the proportion of patients experiencing the competing event, such as death, is equal to or greater than the proportion of patients experiencing the outcome of interest, or when the absolute percentage of the competing event is greater than 10%. Examine cohort effects by comparing survival of patients who are recruited early versus late. Also, verify all assumptions. For instance, in order to use a Cox regression model, it is advised to check the proportional hazards assumption either graphically or by using statistical tests. It is good practice for reviewers and readers of orthopedic literature to pay attention to competing risks. Determine the purpose of the analysis and whether there is only one group or multiple groups of patients. Determine whether the analysis is at the patient or at the joint level. Determine the outcome or outcomes of interest and how they are defined. Assess how patients are followed up over time and if the duration of follow-up is adequate for the duration outcome of interest. Assess the completeness of the follow-up and verify whether there are differences in the follow-up mechanisms between groups. Verify whether the sensory method is sufficiently described in the method section. And finally, determine whether competing risk is a potential concern and how it is accounted for in the analysis.